Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastyatya Adeshatarane Shri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanitya Ananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasani Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Vanchikalpa Tarubias Jai Kripa Sindhu Bia Evacha Paditanam Pavanebio Vaishnavebio Namo Namaha. So we offer our uh, respects to all the Vaishnavas, to all the devotees. So, yes, to begin. Let us read the verse again, verse 7 again, and then we'll continue with the purport. Syat Krishna nama charitadi sitapya vidya pito patapta rasanasya narochika no kint vada rada nudinam kalusaiva jushta swad vi kramad bhavati tad gadamula hantri. So that's the Sanskrit. And now the translation. The holy name, character, pastimes and activities of Krishna are all transcendentally sweet, like sugar candy. Although the tongue of one afflicted by the jaundice of avidya, ignorance, cannot taste anything sweet, it is wonderful that simply by carefully chanting these sweet names every day, every day, a natural relish awakens within his tongue and his disease is gradually destroyed at the root. Hare Krishna. Yes, so that's really very nice. And from yesterday, I'd just like to note something from the verse, which we s did speak about yesterday, but just to remind. Uh, that is that anudinam, anudinam, every day, haradin, well, that's Hindi, but every day, in order for the process to really work, we need to do it every day. At least to work to the maximum degree where we'll really feel good, happy in Krishna consciousness. Uh, even, even if one does a little, it all helps. You remember you remember what uh, Lord Chaitanya told uh, Satyaraj Khan, that a person who just chants the name of Krishna once in their life is the best amongst the common people. So, okay, that's something to meditate on. So now, yes, we're continuing on with the... Uh, the purport, and we read uh, paragraph 5 last night, and we uh, continue with paragraph 6. And it's actually, it's a very important paragraph, and yeah, it's a very important paragraph, and I must say, I've made a whole lot of notes about it. So in the paragraph itself, Srila Prabhupada makes the point that there are three stages, or you could say levels. Prabhupada says stages of the development of the chanting of Hare Krishna. There's the offensive stage, uh, the stage, Prabhupada says, of lessening offenses and the pure stage. So Prabhupada goes on to make the point 
and it's pretty, you know, easily to, easy to understand. I was going to say it's pretty obvious, but it's definitely quite easy to understand that when a person begins chanting Hare Krishna, like I described, I think, last night, when I started, I'd already chanted before, but when I started, I, I tried first time, first time, to chant Japa on beads. Ho, 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 that was a struggle. But anyway, you know, as I explained last night, we got into it step by step, and yeah, and sort of, and broke through uh, before too long. So, but it's natural. When someone is coming from material existence, uh, and, you know, I was going to also say, like, Western material existence, or Russian for that matter, if you come from Indian material existence, well, it's also a problem. It's also a problem. But maybe not as much. But it's, def it's a definitely a problem, actually. That when you first come and you start trying to chant the holy names on beads regularly, uh, that the mind, which has been so used to just doing whatever it wants any time, if it feels good, do it. That was a motto of some of the hippies, by the way. If it feels good, do it. Phew. What sort of standard? But that has been the mind's program since, however, at least during this life, until we took to Krishna consciousness. To, so to now control the mind and focus the mind for 16 rounds is generally a couple of hours, give or take, plus or minus. Uh, to just focus like that, particularly when initially one is not used to it, and the mind is tugging, well, yeah, it's a challenge. But if one perseveres, then one will come to the stage, Prabhupada calls it, the stage of lessening offenses. Offensive stage means, just in very simple terms, that uh, you're trying to chant. It's all about chanting. You're trying to chant, but then your mind decides it wants to go elsewhere, and you can't stop it. This is the offensive stage. You're trying to chant, but your mind is exerting control to the point that at least sometimes, and maybe even really quite often, the mind just dictates, I'm going to think about this, and the focus goes there, even though, you know, the mouth is still chanting, but the attention is wherever the mind went. Yeah, so this is the offensive stage uh, in which it's very, anyway, one has to persevere and it can be a struggle. Incidentally, Vamsi Gopal Prabhu, Yes, now stove near Gavaricha Pangliski. Unas yes, Ruski Peri Vot. Vinsta Grame. Vinsta Grame. Yes, we iti tuda, but it was motion a pani mat. Yasna. Excuse me. Just telling someone who speaks Russian they should go to Instagram. Aha. So yeah, that's sort of, kind of like, in a, in a nutshell, the, uh, a brief but fairly clear description of the offensive stage, uh, that the mind is too strong, and therefore it, you know, more often 
anyway, quite often it takes you away, takes your attention away from your chanting. But the thing is, the chanting is so wonderful that if, if you persevere, despite sometimes, you know, probably feeling a little frustrated even sometimes, uh, with the difficulty of focusing and remaining attentive. But if you persevere, then Krishna, the, the essence really, you know, I think it's an important perspective that if you really persevere despite it not being easy in the early stages, then Krishna, who's definitely watching, you know, he's watching all of us right now and not just from like an external viewpoint looking at our bodies. He's looking at our consciousness. He's in there and he's watching. So if Krishna sees that you really try to persevere and chant and try to give your attention despite sometimes it not being easy, then Krishna becomes merciful. Well, I mean, Krishna is always merciful, but Krishna decides to give some mercy and help you to focus your mind more. Yeah, and plus, you know, just on a, it's not exactly a mechanical level, but, you know, just on, on the level of perseverance, really, that the, the mantra is so powerful that at least if you try to focus, gradually it'll start sticking more and more, even though the mind goes off from time to time. The mantra is, is more powerful. And if you try in, in so many ways, this point of trying your best in chanting, in reading, in preaching, in serving, in everything in Krishna consciousness. Not that you have to become some big expert, but you really should try your best. So if you try your best, then because the mantra is, is so purifying, then gradually the more gross aspects of, of the, the mental habits of meditating on material life, gradually they will become cleansed away. So it's a combination of these different factors. And then you come to the second stage. Well, Prabhupada says the results can be immediate. The results can be immediate. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it varies from person to person. So then, at some point, if you're persevering nicely, and Krishna's merciful, and your mind's becoming purified to some degree, then you come to the stage Prabhupada calls the stage of lessening offenses. Or, that, that's the only time I've ever seen Prabhupada use the term lessening offenses. Generally, the term Prabhupada would use for this second stage is, he would say it is the clearing stage. It means clearing out the nonsense, the undesirable things from the heart, from the mind, uh, so that one really starts to get more taste in the chanting and in everything in Krishna consciousness. So the clearing stage, it's interesting, Prabhupada calls it lessening offenses. <laughs> it means that offenses are still there, but it's not like, you know, just regularly the mind just going off track. Generally, on the in the clearing stage, that the mind is still saying, come on, 
come on, think about this or that, whatever it is. Your, the old days when you're a materialist. Come on, come on. But you have now reached that point of developing at least some spiritual strength and you're getting at least some spiritual taste. So therefore you are able to say no. You are able to say no and stick with that no and keep your mind focused. Even though sometimes it will go off. So it's lessening offenses. Uh, so that stage in the classic sense, in, in the Sanskrit language, Bengali language, in these languages, it's called Nama Bas. Nama Bas, clearing stage, these are basically synonyms, two words for one thing. And Nama Bas, well, literally Nama Bas, it means something like a, a, a reflection of the holy names. Oh, you remember Haridas Thakwa? We mentioned the other day in that meeting where the one person objected. Uh, he said that just a dim reflection of the holy name can give you liberation. Yeah, it means that Nama Bas clearing stage. So, um, Lord Ch in Bhaktivinoda Thakur has written a book called Harinam Chintamani, the wish-fulfilling stone uh, of the holy name. And there, there's a chapter dedicated to Nama Bas. He uses the term Nama Bas there. Although elsewhere he also uses the term clearing. So let me just read a couple of things which he says about the power of Namabas or the clearing stage. Uh, let's see. By Namabas, one becomes purified of the mud of materialism. All fears flee from Nama Bas. A person who chants Nama Bas is safe from all calamities. Yakshas, Rakshasas, Bhutas, Praetas, evil planets, and Anathas all flee from Nama Bas. Oh, yeah. By Nama Bas, the souls fallen into hell are delivered. From Nama Bas, all past karma flees. This is really quite something. Yes. So, so, would you believe, this is Lord Chaitanya speaking, by the way to Haridas Thakwa. Then Lord Chaitanya goes on to say, whoa, a very amazing thing, that by Nama Bas, one can attain Vaikuntha. Haribo. <laughs> That's what Lord Chaitanya says. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, well, yeah, we read. Or did we read? No, we didn't. By Nama Bas, all sins are destroyed. By Nama Bas, liberation is attained. In other words, it's a very amazing thing, that Nama Bas or clearing stage, where you're basically, you're getting fixed, you're getting focused, and you're really getting serious about it. And the mind is, is not so difficult. It may have its moments from time to time, but it's not like how it was in the offensive stage, just running off into all sorts of stuff sometimes. Yeah, so we should, 
so the clearing stage, this is an interesting little point, is the stage of the Madhyam Adhikari, the middle level devotee. If someone is still on the offensive stage, they're basically Kanishta. You know, the, the whole subject of what is Kanishta, what's Madhyam, the different qualities. We went through quite a bit of it, but there's more detail, of course, and that's one more little detail. So then, the, uh, then there's the pure stage, pure chanting. Let me read a verse we read, what now? Yesterday. I think yesterday or the day before. Maybe the day before. This is 11.255. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is so kind to the conditioned souls that if they call upon Him by speaking His holy name, even unintentionally or unwillingly, the Lord is inclined to destroy innumerable sinful reactions in their hearts. Okay, that's a little build up. And now about the pure chanting. Therefore, when a devotee who has taken shelter of the Lord's lotus feet chants the holy name of Krishna with genuine love, the Supreme Personality of Godhead can never give up the heart of such a devotee. One who has thus captured the Supreme Lord within his heart is to be known as Bhagavat Prad Pradhan, the most exalted devotee of the Lord. This is a devotee who is doing pure chanting. He gets control of the Lord. There's the famous example of Lord Chaitanya after initiation, he was initiated in Gaya by Ishvara Puri, who told him, Harinam, Harinam, Eva Kevalam, just chant the holy names, chant the holy names. That's what he told him to do. Now you're initiated, chant. So Lord Chaitanya did. And that evening, when he was chanting, he found he was losing control of himself, meaning ecstatic symptoms were just overwhelming him. Uh, his voice, tears were coming from his eyes. His body was shaking. His voice was stammering. And he couldn't pronounce the mantra properly. So, the next day, this is because, well, this is because he's, he was chanting on the pure level, completely. What would you expect from the Supreme Personality of Godhead? But anyway, the next day, acting as an ordinary person, he went back to his spiritual master, Ishvara Puri, and asked him, what kind of mantra have you given me? You know, either, well, either it's something, you know, I can't understand or else I'm doing something really wrong. Because whenever I try to chant, I can't chant. I can't pronounce the words. And I sort of break into an extreme emotional condition. So what is it? Of course, the Lord knew. And Ishvara Puri knew that the Lord knew. So, Ishra Puri didn't really bother answering the question. He just said, congratulations, my dear child, you have perfected your life. Because he was chanting perfectly. So, uh, okay. Then, then we go on now. I mean, of course, this we could have a whole seminar just on this particular subject, but we we'll move on, and we come to the last four verses 
7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and these verses are focusing on uh, the different stages, not, not of chanting, but stages of development of Krishna consciousness in a, in a general way. Uh, can you answer it? Someone's trying to call me. Just take it in there or somewhere. Excuse me, someone's phoning me on my iPad. Oh boy. All right, so, right. Yeah. So, anyway, Prabhupada, when it comes to, the, well, there are three stages we just discussed about of chanting, offensive, clearing, namabas, and then pure. Now, in terms of the general development of Krishna consciousness, from the beginning to the perfection, not the end, because there's no end, but from the beginning to perfection, there are nine stages. And here in these paragraphs now, Srila Prabhupada uh, goes one by one uh, in giving a description of each stage, step by step. Uh, yeah, so, so let's do that and just briefly, you know, again, it's a subject uh, which is worthy of discussion for days. And there's an idea, a suggestion that we, after finishing Nectar, Nectar of Instruction, that we discuss Madhurya Kadambani, which is a whole book simply about these nine stages. So there's a verse. There's a verse. Adaushrada tata sadhu sangata bhajana kriya tato narta nivrtishat tato nishta rachis tata. Actually, it's two verses. Atasaktis tato bhavas tata prema bhudanchati sadakanam ayam prema prado bhave bhavet krama. So I want to actually, you know what I want to do? I want to give you a reference. I want to give you a reference. So you can now look up this verse. Uh, yeah. And then we'll talk about it. Well, then we'll translate it. Okay, you find it. It's in the purport. You, the easiest place to find it is in the purport of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 10. You can check there. All right, so back we go. Right, so here's the translation. In the beginning, one must have a preliminary desire for self-realization. This will bring one to the stage of trying to associate with persons who are spiritually elevated. So in terms of stages, the preliminary desire, this is the first stage which is called Shraddha or faith. Then this will bring one to the stage of trying to associate with persons who are spiritually elevated. This is the second level, Sadhu Sangha. Then in the next stage, one becomes initiated by an elevated spiritual master and under his instruction, the neophyte devotee begins the process of devotional service. Uh, that, that is bhajana kriya. Then by execution of devotional service under the guidance of the spiritual master, one becomes free of all material attachment attains steadiness in self-realization. Uh, well, okay. One, one becomes free from all material attachment. That's anatha nivriti. And then attains steadiness is nishta. That's the fifth of nine stages. So it's right in the middle. 
steadiness uh, and acquires a taste for hearing about the absolute personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. That's the sixth stage, ruchi, taste. This leads one further forward to attachment for Krishna, for Krishna consciousness. That's asakti, the seventh stage, uh, which is matured in bhava, or the preliminary stage of love of God. Uh, real love of God is called prema, the highest perfectional stage of life. So Prabhupada, as he goes through this in the sixth paragraph, then the following few paragraphs to the end of the purport, he gives a, uh, you know, like a brief synopsis, you could say. Yeah, a little brief summary, but making it nice and clear. What is each stage? So, in, in the sixth paragraph, seventh, seventh paragraph, uh, Prabhupada says, interesting point, the Krishna consciousness movement is especially meant for creating an atmosphere in which people can take to the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. Because it's the main thing to chant Hare Krishna. It's the Yuga Dharma. So one must begin with faith. So faith. Let's just say a couple of words about faith and how, how a person who had, had no faith, maybe they didn't even know of the existence of Krishna consciousness, but they come to the point of having some faith. Yes, it is good. I want to look into it. At least I want to look into it and check it and see. So that's a type of faith. Otherwise, if you don't know about it, or even if you think it's just, you know, not for me, that, that indicates a lack of faith. So where do you get such faith from? Well, the answer is from meeting devotees. Or you could say association with devotees. <clears throat> maybe they give you a book, maybe they give you some prasadam, maybe they speak to you, maybe you just see devotees chanting in the streets, but you have some contact with devotees. And then what Prabhupada refers to in the translation of those two verses about the stages I just read, uh, Prabhupada says, a preliminary desire for self-realization. And it can just take the form of, as I mentioned, let me look into it. There, there's enough faith that it's worth looking into. And so then when, then, uh, Prabhupada says, then a person, uh, if they have some faith, they, uh, well, what happens is the next stage is sadhu sangha or, or associating with devotees. So on the basis of little faith, just a preliminary interest, they come and they associate with devotees, I mean, in a more focused way, actually spending time with the devotees and discussing like that. Uh, so that's sadhu sangha, the second stage. Then, and Prabhupada gives some examples in this paragraph, that we're sending Sankirtan parties out all over. And uh, that even, even in all sorts of places where people never heard of Hare Krishna, people are becoming interested. And people, uh, people are coming and joining and taking part. Uh, and Prabhupada says, in some areas, people get, begin to imitate the devotees 
by shaving their heads and chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra only a few days after hearing the mantra. Yeah. So like this, there's some more concentrated type of association and the person feels, yes, the desire starts to manifest. I want to get into this. Uh, yeah. So then, so now associating with devotees and getting some experience from it and then feeling, I want to do this myself. That's the third stage, bhaj bhajana kriya, which literally, you know, bhajan, we all know bhajan and bhajana is the more formal Sanskrit term and kriya means activities. So activities of devotional service. One becomes practically engaged in devotional service. <clears throat> so then Prabhupada, when the devotee starts getting practically engaged, Prabhupada says, uh, some imitators, well, and not just imitators, but some of these people who they're associating some interest is developing, they become interested in being initiated by the spiritual master and offer themselves for initiation. <clears throat> if one is sincere, he's initiated. And this stage is called Bhajana Kriya. Prabhupada on a number of occasions equated, um, equated uh, Bhajana Kriya with initiation. It's maybe not absolutely the, the, like the same thing, but certainly initiation can only take place when some good solid bhajana kriya is happening and one is committed or feeling committed and then one can take vows. So then initiation therefore is sort of like you could say an advanced level of bhajana kriya something along those lines. We're in, uh, we are in paragraph, I think, eight. Let's, oops, Krishna. Oh, let me just close this thing here. <laughs> okay. All righty. So we are, where are we? We are, we have evolved to Paragraph 8, yes. Uh, engaged practically in devotional service. Paragraph 8 is the paragraph beginning, if one is sincere, he's initiated. So then one re regularly engages in devotional service, chanting 16 rounds, uh, following the regulative principles, becoming purified. And Prabhupada says a very interesting thing. Listen to this. Such a devotee who's like nicely engaged and initiated in Krishna consciousness and really committed, no longer goes to a restaurant or, or hotel to taste so-called palatable dishes. Well, certainly not made with meat and onions. Nor does he care to smoke or drink tea or coffee. He not only refrains from illicit sex, but avoid sex life entirely. Haribo! <laughs> Take sannyas. Well, in many, in, in some cases at least, they do that. But at least no illicit sex life. And, well, I can just tell you a, a tiny little anecdote. I gave, was giving initiation um, In, in here in Durban, I think, many years ago, and there was one elderly lady there. She was well into her 70s. And she was getting initiated and she had to recite the regulative principles, which she did. And everything was okay. Then she came to the illicit sex one. And she just looked at me. She just looked at me. 
And she said in a very strong verse, and no sex. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's really nice. That's really nice. So now being initiated and committed and regularly engaged in devotional service, the devotee is now making like solid progress. Things have changed from a little while ago. And then the devotee comes to the next stage. It's the fourth stage called Anatha Nivriti means nullifying or removing the unwanted things. Now there's a lot of work that goes on on that level. Of all the levels in terms of work, there's probably more work to be done on the level of Anatha Nivriti because we have many bad habits, attachments, attractions, desires, and habits and old habits die hard, as we mentioned, <clears throat> and as I'm sure you're well aware. Uh, so, so Anatha Navriti means taking shelter of Krishna, seriously practicing, and by his grace, becoming free, or at least to, <clears throat> to a very large degree, free, <clears throat> from those, those old habits and attractions and desires, Anatha Nivriti. So then, now <clears throat> we've gone on to the ninth chapter, which is the second to last, is it? It is. It's the second to last uh, paragraph. Second to la last paragraph, paragraph nine. When a person's relief from unwanted things, he becomes fixed in executing his Krishna activities. Yeah, this is Nishta. Having sorted out to a large extent and got rid of one's attachments and attractions and so on, the more those gross sides of our existence in material life, and <laughs> means to a large degree becoming free from the attraction to illicit sex. Gambling, of course, that's another thing. I mean, it's very rare that that's a serious problem for devotees. Intoxication, well, it's also rare, although it does happen. Illicit sex, though, that can be quite a killer of Krishna consciousness. But through Anathana Nivriti, making real progress, through chanting seriously, serving seriously, and, and following the instructions of the spiritual master, so many of these things become at least to a large extent cleansed out. So, and then as Prabhupada said, the devotee becomes fixed. And this is nishta, which literally means steadiness. Even though challenges may be there and will be there sometimes, but the devotee remains fixed and doesn't go off track. And, and of course, when one has come to that point, then, then one is just absorbed in Krishna consciousness pretty much the whole time, without having to struggle very much with, with these lower desires and habits and all these things. So with, with those obstacles removed and being strongly focused on Krishna, then, well, you know what happens is that life becomes easier. Life becomes much easier because the main problems have gone. So from the point of nishta onwards, progress accelerates. 
because there's, there's nothing, or not nothing, but there's much less holding you back, much less. And so therefore, Prabhupada, you know what Prabhupada does in the second to last paragraph, eight, he just sort of skips through almost uh, to the stage of bhava. Uh, the devotee, indeed, the devotee becomes attached to such activities. So even ruchi or taste has been skipped over completely and asakti or attachment to Krishna uh, is now being mentioned, attached to these activities and experiences ecstasy in executing devotional service. This is called bhava. And then Prabhupada does not really go into, he mainly continues discussing bhava actually. He doesn't really go into Krishna prema here. Um, but we, he mentions it's the preliminary awakening of one's dormant love for God. So the thing is, love of God, Krishna Prema, is compared to the sun. And the sun, when, when it's like at midday or one o'clock or something, when it's right at the peak, and it's just so bright and, yeah, fully bright, dazzling. But then, but there is a stage, and we actually mentioned this the other day, there is a stage where one has been through, except for, you know, we've just mentioned Bhava, but we, one has been through all the stages up to this point successfully. And now, developing deep attachment for Krishna uh, and the heart is almost totally cleansed. Well, an interesting point I can mention in Narada Bhakti Sutras in one purport, Srila Prabhupada makes the point that on the level of asakti, one can see what is one's eternal relationship with Krishna. So that all, all those different stages up to this point, just before bhava, those are all different stages of sadhana bhakti, meaning practice. Bhava and prema are not part of practice. They are part of perfection. But again, back to our example of the sun. There's a, a stage of the rising of the sun where it hasn't come above the horizon but the light is coming above the horizon. You know what I mean. This is the stage of bhava. So it's described as surya angsu, surya angsa, surya angsu means like a ray, one ray of the sun of Krishna Prema. And that sun is just so brilliantly dazzling. This is just one little ray. But it is part of Krishna Prema. It's part of it, but little, very small part. And therefore it's differentiated from Prema as such. Because it's, it's relatively speaking, so much smaller. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, like this, the devotee comes to the level of bhava where the devotee is clearly aware of his or her eternal rasa with Krishna and is even getting ready to enter into that. Uh, yes, and then, then uh, coming to the level of Krishna prema. And Prabhupada makes an interesting point. Last paragraph. Although maya may be present, it cannot disturb a devotee once he attains the bhava stage. 
Because the devotee on the level of bhava, it's not part of practice, getting yourself together. It's perfection. So it means it's above the whole uh, of material existence. So the devotee can see very clearly what is what and is not affected by the material world. So like this, the devotee becomes liberated, comes to the level eventually of Krishna Prema and goes back to Godhead. And let us conclude just by reading this one verse right at the end here from Madhya Leela 22.31 Krishna Surya Sama Mayahaya Andakara Yaham Krishna Tahan Nahi Mayara Adika Krishna is compared to sunshine and Maya is compared to darkness. Wherever there is sunshine, there cannot be darkness. As soon as one takes to Krishna consciousness, the darkness of illusion, the influence of the external energy, will immediately vanish. Hare Krishna. So there you go, devotees. Uh, that's Nectar of Instruction, verse 7. Hope you found it interesting. Hope you were able to follow it. I know it was getting a little complicated towards the end. But uh, yes, now we're going on to verse 8 and we really go up a step. <laughs> oh yes, it becomes extremely interesting and very deep. So, uh, so thank you all very much. Sheila Prabhupad Ki Jai. Okay, you can switch it off, it's all right. And this, switch it off. Yeah, okay. Um, tomorrow questions? Vaprosi. Okay. So, devotees, you heard that. Tomorrow is questions. On verse 7, okay? You, you know the system by now. Uh, Facebook to Pray Magni, David Asi, and uh, Instagram, Kirti Kumari Radhe. Before midday tomorrow, and then tomorrow evening we'll go through the questions. Hare Krishna.